Hello everybody, uh, my name is John Brink, uh, I'm podcasting with On The Brink. My guest today is very special, uh, is Dr. Tracy and uh, here in Prince George and we are uh, podcasting from a location, downtown Prince George and all around us is downtown Prince George, British Columbia. Uh, for those that uh, listen to us and watch us uh, all around the world, uh, you know, Prince George is uh, British Columbia, obviously it's in Canada. It's about 800 kilometers north of Vancouver. And Dr. Tracy, uh, uh, a special guest, guest today because she is the first guest for me uh, with this particular series of uh, podcasts that we are doing. So welcome to the show, uh, uh, Tracy. Thank you, John. It's wonderful to be here today. So, you are a medical doctor. Should I call you Dr. Tracy or can I call you just Tracy? It varies. I mean, some people like to call me by the official name Dr. Lotz, right, yeah. which is my, you know, my, my surname. And then often with patients, when I, when I try to be more relaxed, I let them call, it, call me Dr. Tracy. And then with friends, I'm always just Tracy. Yeah. And yeah. so I'll call you for now Dr. Tracy. So, sure. uh, and, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about, uh, you, you're a medical doctor yes. and someone like me, uh, I can hear likely that you were not born in Canada or North America. So tell us a little bit of where you originated from. I was born and bred in South Africa, Cape Town, probably one of the most beautiful cities in the world. And I think those who've been there would definitely agree with me. Um, moved, so interestingly enough, childhood dream to come to Canada. So since the age of six, wanted to be a doctor and moved to Canada. I can't tell you why, I didn't know anyone here. Nobody in my family had graduated high school, so there was no one to be, you know, role modeling on. And uh, got to med school and then just made sure I could get myself to Canada. So I moved to Canada in 2008 when I was 28. Yeah. Um, and then to Fort St. James initially for about four years. So why Fort St. James? Because of all places, <laughs> uh, you know, why would you, I would think uh, Montreal, Toronto, yes, Vancouver, maybe. Yes. Why, why Fort St. James? It's a tricky situation. The, the medical kind of societies between South Africa and Canada at that point had kind of a, an agreement where they wouldn't poach the doctors from South Africa. So technically you can't hire a foreigner um, directly off, off the bat, but they do have agencies that actually help with the recruitment. And as long as you meet the criteria, you're able to kind of license at that point, license into let's say private clinics. So I went just online to look for some information on different places that I could work in Canada. Uh, there's different regulations for different provinces. So it gets quite tricky actually from South Africa. The, the, it's mostly BC and Alberta that have a relatively easy, uh, kind of, uh, transition that we can move into and then Saskatchewan is a little trickier so mm -hmm. Montreal Toronto those places are very very hard to get into and there was a little private clinic in Fort St. James advertising in one of the medical magazines that said if you want to come work here and I just I contacted them directly and they were able to arrange it did you come on your own I came with my ex-partner at the time also right. South African so right. we moved together from South Africa here. also but, a medical but, doctor no 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 someone who was working more in uh, business and advertising right yeah. right yeah. yeah and just the two of us packed up our bags packed up the entire house yeah and we moved here yeah yeah, it's quite an undertaking, not unsimilar to what I did, yes. because I had the same as you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, I wrote about it in my book, uh, Against All Odds. Uh, you know, the, I already developed a dream when I was uh, mm -hmm. five, and then Canada was uh, the favorite place to go, and also British Columbia, yeah. Prince George, not far from Fort St. James. So the, y your education as a medical doctor, mm -hmm. did you receive that in uh, South did. Africa? Yes, yeah, so University of Cape Town. Yeah. Um, really beautiful university. Unfortunately, just went through some devastating fires at the beginning of this year where large portions of the university were burnt down. Oh, and we're talking about, uh, I want to say February, March, don't quote me on the month, oh. but devastating fires to the library, to the original windmill that is right next to the university as well. And these are over, yeah. you know, over 100 years old original buildings and things like that. So beautiful campus. Um, it's a little different system in South Africa when we go to med school. So if you're able to qualify with all the criteria and with your marks, um, I did start med school straight out of high school. I didn't have to do a pre-med or an undergraduate degree. And then I did a six year program. So the first two years are kind of like a, an undergraduate degree, I guess your biochems, your physics, your things like that. And then the last four years, very medical. And then once we graduate, we become an intern just for one year and then South Africa introduced a community service 
kind of payback to keep the doctors a little bit longer. So we, we had to do our community service here. And then after that, you're a free doctor to, to work either in South Africa or abroad if you wanted to. Right. Now, now you know, but, but makes me always wonder at that age of being only yes. five or six years old, but but made you draw towards the medical profession? I honestly, when I try to think back many times, I, I can't put a finger on it. Like I said, nobody in my family is in medicine. Um, most, you know, my dad was a postal worker. My mom was an office worker. My family hadn't graduated high school. Um, and I can honestly tell you, and if, if you ask those who were around me at that time, I always said I was going to be a doctor. And yeah. it's the only dream I ever had. And in, interestingly enough, um, initially, it's, it's unfortunately obviously a very skewed system as it is everywhere else in the world, but initially I didn't actually get into med school. Right. Um, so at that point, you know, when they notified me and said, you didn't get accepted. And I, I'd only applied for two universities. I'd hoped to stay in the province that I grew up in. And, and I was devastated. I thought, I don't know what else to do. Right. Like there is nothing else in me because this, this doesn't seem like a career for me. This seems like my life. Right. I've always known this is what I'm going to be because it's who I am. So you came out of a high school. Mm -hmm. You were 18, 19 or 18 years old. And, yeah. and then directly went into uh, the University of Cape Town. But I'm hearing about it, but I, I've heard about it. It's a fairly famous, uh, well-known university. It is, uh, it is. And it's, it's a really, it, it really ca carried good reputation. I mean, right. I, I'm not watching statistics now to say where right. it's sitting in rankings right now, but really had had a reputable reputation. Internationally. And, uh, internationally, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then you were in there for six years. Yes. Then, so I believe that uh, the, the medical training and taught by at least that university is recognized throughout the world. But yes. did you have to do here to, did you have to qualify again? I or? did. I had to do a number of exams again. So yeah. the exams that I had to do were very much the same as what the local uh, medical students have to do. We were able to work while we were doing that. So yeah. I it was fixed into time periods, one year, two year, five years that you had to, you meet the requirements and then do the examinations. Yeah. I was fortunately enough, fortunate enough to pass all the examinations with my first attempt. Yeah. Um, so then that so actually gives good. me a Canadian license then. So in theory, I have two medical degrees. Yeah. Um, which, yeah. But you, you're not only a medical doctor, you are also a surgery and do a number I, of other things. Right? I do emergency medicine as well. So when I worked in South Africa before I moved to Canada, my passion has always been emergency medicine. Right. Um, I did a little bit of extra training there at the time. And then with that, I was able to grandfather in here into the emergency medicine kind of field. Carried on that a little bit in Fort St. James and then I still work in the emergency department here. Yeah. I also work on our sexual assault team. So yeah. we're, a, we're a smaller team that deal with all of the sexual assaults. So yeah. I've been doing that for a number of years. And then I have, I, I, I always say I'm not fond of surgery because I, I feel like I get too hot and I'm standing around because I'm not a, the main surgeon. Um, but I have assisted many times with surgeries and things like that as well. Yeah. yeah. And no, then, no. Yeah. And then just the, the, when I do the work at the walking clinic, it's kind of more urgent care and, and right. acute care. Yeah. So in, in the time that I've known you, uh, I've known you recently. <laughs> Well, but then I also knew you already before that. I'll talk about that a little yes. bit later. But, uh, you know, so then I always wonder, you know, the, uh, you're such a nice person. I'm not saying that because you're sitting there, because you are. Thank you. And, and then I always wonder, what, what do her patients think of her? So I go to, <laughs> hey, what, where does she rate? You know where you're rating, right? <laughs> you're the top. Yeah, I just had to tell you that. Thank because you. I, 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 I do, I don't know, I... I I can honestly only say that I don't, like people ask me, am I smart? You know, what is it like to be a doctor? And I've always said, I, it's not something that I have to think about. I feel like it's just something that I am. Yeah. And I've always tried to be very personable. I haven't tried to be standoffish or any of those things. And, yeah. and I feel like that must make a difference. But you're not only good at what you do, you're also a very caring individual. Thank right? you. Right, and the people... Yeah that uh, are your clients, uh, you know, say mm -hmm. that, you know, mm -hmm. and you, I think you're close to a five, this is high as you can get. <laughs> by, uh, so I actually just said that because that's yeah. important. Thank you. You know, so the, uh, so, so then you were in Fort St. James, what happened then? Then you went from there 
you moved to Prince George. So. Yes, I, th I think, you know, a lot of people go, why don't you move to Vancouver, Kelowna? A lot of the doctors kind yeah. of move from these small towns to big cities. There is one, there's one motto that I live by, that the grass is not greener somewhere else, it's green where you water it. Exactly. So I could move anywhere else and yeah. not necessarily solve all the problems that I think I have here or yeah. find all the happiness that I think is maybe missing. Right. Um, it was a work opportunity. My ex-spouse had managed, had gotten, secured a job here locally in Prince George. So yeah. the move became appropriate for us. Yeah. It would have been a little far for the, the two hour commute and we were expecting our first child. Yeah. Um, and it just yeah. made you, sense. Your first movie. daughter, you have two daughters, I have right? two daughters, yes. Yeah. yeah. But Maddie and... Madison and Bella. Yeah. 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 So it was, it was really just kind of the move that was right for the family at that time. Yeah. You know, even at this point, people go Vancouver, Kelowna, where do you want to go? Of course, I would like to go somewhere where it's hotter for longer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm African after all. I like the warm weather. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you move when, when the situations are right, when the... Yeah. When, yeah. So now you've been in Prince George for mm -hmm. how long? About eight years. Eight yeah. years. And, uh, you know, and, and you have uh, been involved, uh, you're entrepreneurial, you're just not, with all due respect to your uh, peers, but yeah. you're just not a uh, medical doctor, but you're yeah. also entrepreneurial. I think you were involved in uh, a number of clinics, private clinics, and yeah. then obviously you do a lot of other yeah. things. Yeah. You're a busy person. Uh, uh, <laughs> why is that? You, you're kind of a... Uh, yeah, I always say the busier I am, I'd like to think the higher I function, which, yeah. which uh, I, you know, I've spent my entire life um, enjoying the spoils of, of having some ADHD. Um, yeah. It's allowed me to kind of do many things at once, hopefully at least partially successfully with everything. It's allowed me to maintain a higher pace. And, yeah. and although sometimes it gets a little overwhelming, yeah. um, it definitely, I definitely find my comfort in being busy. And, yes. and so the uh, acronym ADHD yes. stands for? Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Yeah. So there's a couple of variations to that. Um, some, these, so the, interesting enough, it's a very genetic condition, actually more genetic than diabetes. So often parents with any kind of ADHD or ADD, which is Attention Deficit Disorder, you will often see at least one of their children or, or more than one of their children may have the traits as well. Yeah. And, and, and if you kind of look back, uh, you know, I don't know mm -hmm. when you discovered this or how it was discovered. I think in my childhood, it, it, was, it wasn't diagnosed as much because I played at least three sports any season. So yeah. I was a competitive kickboxer most of my uh, teenage years, national champion for five years running, yeah. competed internationally. I would also play field hockey. Um, so I would play field hockey, squash. I played water polo, I swam, and then I did my competitive kickboxing. So with ADHD, we do find physical exercise really helps calm the brain or treat the condition. So right. with that, I was able to not necessarily notice as much that I had it. But I think those around me would have told you, I never stopped talking. I was always on the move. So yeah. in, in, it's fairly typical with that particular condition. It can be, yes. Yeah. And then, and then in other cases, uh, you know, what is uh, sometimes not well understood is because the uh, A kind of looking back and as you know, I'm ADHD. Mm -hmm. You know, when uh, I was not discovered, uh, I, I self-discovered because I found a book in a bookstore and said, oh my God, that's me. You know, so uh, and uh, I think that was when I was 58. Okay. You know, I, I realized I was going into my final exams of med school and um, I could never study. I, I honestly tell you, I, I really battled to study. I had three companies during med school. That was the question. <laughs> I mean, three companies while I'm in med school that yeah. I was successfully running. And I went to my doctor and I said, there's no ways I'm going to pass my final exams because no. I cannot sit still for five minutes. Yeah. And she said, but you have ADHD. Like, of course you can't. And, yeah. and that's when I was officially diagnosed was about two months before yeah you know the end of med school it's kind of amazing because then you were still around 18 so at that point i would have been about 25 because i was 25 or 24 i was finishing med school yeah so yeah. so there you were then uh, mm. uh trying to do the math here but uh, mm. you know the so that was about uh, 15 years ago or so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and so that's just about the time that a, it became more common to talk about ADD or ADHD. Yes. There was still a lot of stigma attached to it. There was a and, lot of stigma, yes. And, and uh, what I remember is for me, uh, I, I, 
uh, I kind of look back at it now differently, but when I found the book when I was 58 here mm -hmm. in the store mm -hmm. in Prince George, I wrote in the book in Dutch actually, now finally I know who I am. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Know? But there was still, when uh, I grew up, uh, I failed grade three. Yeah. And uh, I failed a year of med school. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> I, so, I, so I graduated a, a year later than I should have. But, you know, and, and interestingly enough, that was the year that the Twin Towers collapsed. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and, and, and then I failed grade seven, uh, yeah. seven three times. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, because there was still stigma, they didn't know what to do with mm -hmm. me. And uh, they were considering to send me to uh, mentally challenged yeah. uh, school, school. Yes. And, and, and they didn't do that. Instead, they, uh, I got my first job when I was 14. Yeah. And, and so the point that I really want to make mm -hmm. in regards to ADHD, that, and, and that's why we have uh, interviews about it, but also uh, uh, I wrote a book, uh, Against All Odds, came out uh, uh, March the 12th, and we're writing another one about uh, ADHD, mm -hmm. and that will come out next June, mm -hmm. the first. And kind of looking at a number of different people that uh, have discovered yeah. that they had ADHD, yeah. and, and, and where did he go from there, yeah. and especially a number of people like, even like yourself, that has been so successful in all yes. the things that you did, and you are so together in terms of a person, other people would say the same, and uh, although it's difficult to talk about myself, obviously, but <laughs> I've been quite successful in business, yes. and and uh, you know, and and so the way I kind of look at it, that uh, it is now kind of moving into an area where the stigma is kind of going off of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I meet virtually on a daily basis, virtually people yeah. that, as I talk about, that we will be writing about it, that are still struggling with it, either for themselves or oh. inside the families. Yeah. You as a medical doctor, yeah. I'm sure, encounter it. Uh, yes. I mean, I was, I think I was just lucky that my doctor at the time was open to it because her daughter had it. Had her daughter not had it, I'm not sure I would have been received with the same kind of positivity at I the agree. time. Um, I can tell you, I can see kids all the time that do have it at the clinics. And unfortunately, they're not all as, as lucky as you and I are in that it allows them to be more successful. Right. Because unfortunately, these kids are not able to manage. I always, I always speak of my squirrels. So people who know me will speak of my squirrels. I say my squirrels are running crazy in my head. Right. And I need my squirrels to slow down. Exactly. And um, so unfortunately, they don't tend to, to find a way to get control of their squirrels and aren't able to, to ground it. Like I said, sport for me has always seemed to, to help keep them at bay, if I can put it that way. Yeah. You, you see the accomplishment that I would think in mm -hmm. terms of success and, and people reconciling that it is not a bad thing. In fact, it is the opposite. So I call it the superpower. It that is, is a superpower, no question, without a doubt. That, yes. that is no question. Yes. That I could not do the things that I'm doing, and, and sometimes all around me is, mm -hmm. is chaos, but uh, I always have a way of putting things together, and mm -hmm. it gives me the ability. I'm not, I, I'm not medicated in any way. Yeah. Uh, I'm just me for what I am, yeah. and, uh, and I'm at peace with it. And, uh, you know, so, and, and have to a certain extent reconcile that in terms of how, does, how do I make ADHD work for me effectively. When I did the self-diagnosis, I went to Google and looked at the list of yes. 20 indicators. I had 19 and the one that I did not have because I taught myself not to have is impulsivity because oh. I, I have to train myself. Yes. Naturally, I want to be, but in business, I cannot do yes. that. And so uh, I had all, for all intents and purposes, all 20 of them yeah. and, and taught myself to be different. The other part that uh, I found uh, uh, quite helpful in my case is uh, I, I lacked self-confidence because mm -hmm. of it, okay. because of the lack of formal yes. education and other things that I thought I had failed. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so, uh, but help me to a certain extent is uh, Toastmasters. And uh, okay. I was a Toastmaster for 10 years and, yeah. uh, and rose right to yeah. the top of Toastmasters. Is that, but we do, I believe, as one trait that I may have is that uh, I'm in such a big hurry that I'm ahead of myself a lot of times. <laughs> it, I taught myself not to do that. Yeah. And, and what Toastmasters did for me, 
uh, initially I didn't want to go there and, uh, and then when I did go I became more and more involved because typical ADHD is once you see something, I believe you have that, that you love the medical profession and you were very, very good at it and mm -hmm. interested in it. Mm -hmm. The problem that I had in school, they had nothing that interested that me liked, yeah. and so therefore I really was never there. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and so mm -hmm. the, uh, the Toastmasters, what it allowed me to do is uh, to train myself to become a better listener and then cl think clearly before mm -hmm. I before communicate. Answer, yes. That has helped me. Yeah. And, uh, but I say to a lot of people that uh, have uh, an amazing amount, as you have, that I have encountered that I either have uh, children that are mm -hmm. affected by or yeah. others. and. Uh, yeah. And I believe that uh, our book will at least contribute to opening up some of these stories around yes. uh, ADHD and hopefully yeah, and give people more And there's more different confidence. ways that, like you were saying, you know, for you, you like confidence. And I think anyone who knew me in my childhood would say I was always relatively confident. And I, I don't know where that comes from. Yeah. I've always been confident, happy to stand up, speak for myself, those kind of things. Interestingly enough, I think what my ADHD made me feel and still probably does to this day is that I'm not successful. Not. Be no, yeah. because it seems so easy for me to be able to do these things that people are saying is so hard. Yeah. So I'm going, but that didn't feel like a big deal. So this can't be successful. So therefore, I always see myself as not being successful, despite the things that I may achieve that others see as success, because in my head, I can still imagine a hundred other things that I think I could do yeah. that would be bigger. I have the same, uh, Dr. Tracy. Yeah. I still feel that. Uh, you know, I could have done much more than yeah. I did. And everybody yeah. says, oh, you're so successful. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So, and that's another part about yeah. it. That, uh, so know, it's not so. a lack of self-confidence as much yeah. as it makes it, yeah, it, it just kind of makes you feel like you, you, you know, you haven't really achieved anything. Although people see you as a success, you don't see correct. yourself as a success. Yeah, yeah. correct. Yeah. Yeah. So the, uh, uh, you know, so then uh, looking at that, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, that part of medicine, Mm -hmm. You have done very, very successful and, and using ADHD to your benefit and sub subsequently have f gone further mm -hmm. in terms of exploring mm -hmm. other things in medicine. Yes, and interesting enough, I'll just give you the statistic. They say about 60 to 75% of emergency medicine doctors have ADHD. Amazing, yeah? Because, and I always tell people, I say, when it gets more chaotic in the emergency department, I feel calmer. You know, I don't go into panic. I'm not running around. I feel quite calm if there's multiple things happening in a panicky way. And I think many of our, my colleagues are similar in that, again, it works as our superpower to allow us to do that kind of job. I and do. you'd probably find it similar with many of our military veterans. Yeah. Um, I feel many of them probably had ADHD and feel quite calm in that setting. Um, not that that setting is very healthy, but you know, when they're serving the country and things like that, yes. Yeah, and yeah. that's the benefit of it, right? Yes. So that's what becomes the superpower. Yeah. Yeah. So the uh, talking mm -hmm. a little bit more about medicine, mm -hmm. as we, you know, looking back to yes. medicine, to me, there was always a myth around, uh, you know, I go see the doctor and uh, then, uh, you know, the, fortunately I didn't have to go too often, but, uh, and, and I knew them, but it was usually in, in the way that, uh, you know, they have about five minutes yes. at the most. And then from there on in, uh, you know, the, uh, th there was not all that much of a system to it. Uh, I always remember going into the doctor's office and then the doctor that I had had a file, even with the little things that I yes. had, just back and you go like this. Scratching through, to the papers, you know, yes. Yeah. You still did and that. and yeah. then, uh, you know, then, uh, okay, well, it's all okay. And then, uh, you know, you, you never were quite sure, you know, if, if there are things that, uh, yeah, how can I be preemptive in terms of saying that? How can I, because most people don't really know, no. uh, you know, if it is yeah. diet, if it is yeah. lifestyle and, yes. and all the other things. And, uh, and, and some of that's also very different in different countries, right? So in North America, though, people kind of, because they see more, there's a lot, you know, I mean, there's social media all over the world, but the medical system is quite different in North America. And I use the kind of the general term North America. America's medical system is very different to Canada. But if I consider comparatively to Africa and here, there are no screening things. There are none of these things that you can do. You, you don't really go to the doctor unless you're sick. Yeah. Because there, each time you have to go, you have to pay. 
Yeah. So you're paying, there's no free medical system no. um, in the sense, you know, if there, there is a free hospital system if you were sick, but it's, it's very run down, it's, it's very uh, derelict and, and you don't want to end up there, unfortunately. And so in that, in that country, you only see the doctor if you're sick. So, you know, you'd go in for your strep throat, you'd go in for your warts in your toes when you're a kid, uh, you got a bad cut. I remember, I remember cutting my chin open, it was probably about 12. Um, I was very clumsy because you're always going too fast, of course. Yeah. And uh, cut my chin open uh, and they take me to my doctor's office and he would just stitch you up in the office there and then send you off. And I, it was another time I cut myself open. So those are the kind of things you went for. Where in Canada, because with the MSP system, which really kind of gives everybody access to medical care, which is amazing, it does mean that people are constantly coming in for no reason almost, or yeah. with, without kind of any surety of what they're supposed to be doing or things like that. And then yeah. of course we have the system as well where everybody wants to be screening for something. Everybody's always scared. You've got Google added to medicine now. So everybody's Googling things and they want to come in and I, I need this checked and I need a, like, you know, I had, you know, this is just a comment. Somebody made the comment the other day. They said, I want a full metabolic panel done. And yeah. I, I sat there thinking, I don't know what this person wants. No, no. Because there's no such thing. Yeah. But you go into Google and they created all of these, um, yeah. you know, scenarios where get screened for this every couple of years. You know, but if we go back to classic medicine, you, we, we, we monitor um, babies and, and, and you know, children when they're really young. Other than that, we really don't monitor people. And then we kind of bring it back when, when men are 40 and women are closer to 50 and say, okay, at this point you should be checking in with us again yeah and in between it's just a gray zone of come in when you're sick yeah um yeah so as and so that's what we have now mm -hmm. you know then uh, uh usually what we see about the medical system it's it's good in canada better than yes. in some other places yes on the other hand we all get equally yes the same and, yes. and, uh, and I can tell you that even as a physician, that I get, got the same treatment many times as my patients. I didn't always get bumped to head of the line. You know, even I had cancer too. I've had cancer, I've survived. And even at that point, I had to wait my six or my eight weeks for my appointment. And you know, you, you're put in line. Yeah. Um, it's not always as accessible, um, but there, that, that comes down to the question of whose life is more valuable, right? Yeah. So that's the argument is, but yeah. if, I, if you're more important and I push you ahead, that means you're trying to say that your life is more valuable. And we always want to acknowledge that everybody's life is equally valuable. Yeah. yeah. And, and, uh, and I believe your, your touch with cancer was recently, right? Relative well, I recently had, years a, a, I, I, two years ago, it, it will be, well, 2018. Yeah. So uh, just three years now. And then I recently had kind of a little scare again, but it was all clear after that. But... Yeah. It is. It's it's very scary. And even even as a physician, yeah. I didn't know how to toggle myself through the system. No, I didn't know what was next. Yeah. Um, I you know once it got all cleared and I had my surgeries and my things like that, I was just left. Like nobody followed up on me. Um, I no. didn't you know I didn't know who to check in for screening any of that. It 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 is kind of a scary place to be. Yeah. And, and it probably taught you something else in terms of that. You know, although you are a very able uh, medical doctor and mm -hmm. physician and mm -hmm. have had the exposure yeah. that you have to be even more alert to your body, body in terms of doing more preemptive. Yes, How can we, definitely. what can we possibly do to be much more proactive in terms exactly. of... Exactly, in, pre in preventing disease. And the, the preventing yes. and, and living healthy lifestyles yes. and avoiding the obvious and... Yes. Uh, and what can we do about that? I mean, and the biggest thing I think, and people really feel that this is overstated, and I don't think it's overstated enough, is our diet. And unfortunately, the food quality in industrialized countries is getting poorer and poorer. You have to eat clean food. Yeah. Right? And if you don't eat clean food, the body can only run so well because we're exposed to toxins, we're exposed to stress, we're exposed to disease, and you have to stay physically active. The two biggest things would be, you know, a healthy diet. And I'm not saying you can't eat McDonald's. I'm saying you have to eat clean at least 80% of the time. Yeah. You have to stay physically active. And unfortunately, walking the dog around the corner or around the block, 
doesn't count as physical activity, no. right? And then you have to try and get enough sleep, which isn't always a reality for very busy, you know, right. people with or, or jobs where they're working uh, shift work. Where well, the guys it becomes are a question nights. of priority, right? Yes. Because no matter how busy it may appear to be, yeah. if you're not healthy, then you have no, no. <laughs> nothing. You know, and, so. and and something that it's something that I believe very strongly in, and. Uh, you, you can look at the statistics as well. I do believe that alcohol is a number one factor in probably the entire world for disease burden. Yeah. So excessive alcohol use yeah. and causing not just disease, but causing financial strife to families. And then that creates, you know, oh. neglect with children, neglect with family members, neglecting job, self-neglect. Um, obviously, when you're doing that, you're not eating healthy. So as much as there are many dr drug crises, yeah. you know, we look at fentanyl, we look at, um, you know, marijuana use, all of those things are, of course, very catastrophic. Yeah. But in my opinion, the alcohol issue is the number one understated health issue. Yeah. And, and it's not only from the perspective of being physically unhealthy, it is also destroys families it destroys and everything around them so families relationship jobs yeah. you cannot maintain yeah. your job um you know the, the possible negative even if you show up drunk yeah. you know driving drunk things like that it, it's really it's the one thing that people it's just become such a lifestyle everybody goes home and has a beer has you know every most of the people I know in a similar age group to me, you know, that I like, can't wait to get home and have my glass of wine or I'm, I'm going to yoga and wine or we're doing paddle boarding and wine or, you know, we're having beers at the end of our, our hike. So everything is very driven around the alcohol and right. to a degree, it's almost the only thing driving them to do it. Yeah. And yet the, the positive that they're trying to create is then followed with a negative. Yeah. And I can honestly say one other thing that you have to have if you want to live a good life is a positive attitude. Yeah. Because without a positive attitude, you can be gifted with everything you ever need and want. Yeah. And it's not going to be, it's not going to be enough. Usually what I do is, uh, you know, for me, the foundation is attitude, passion, work ethic. Passion. Result, you have some passion. success. Yes. No matter what you try to pursue, yes. that once you have that, yes. then that gives you uh, a, a good way towards yeah. success. The, the other thing about medicine that, uh, you know, the, it is the mad, there is so much information out there, mm -hmm. either in, uh, uh, you know, health, uh, in, in pills that are uh, off, uh, over the counter. Yes. Uh, so the, uh, and, and, but a lot of them are, are uh, not There are a lot of supplements. There are a lot of vitamins. There are a lot of, you know, health directive kind of, uh, medication, drugs, teas, toxins, things you can access. And, and really many, many of them are not, not necessary. If you look at many of the over-the-counter stuff, there's not always regulation to the dosing, no. whether it's clean, whether you're even getting, you know, they, they, you, let's just pick magnesium. Magnesium is a great natural supplement people should be taking for themselves. But if you're not buying a good quality magnesium, you're not knowing what you're getting, um, or it may not be the right kind. You know, and then we get many teas. People buy a lot of licorice things. Licorice is a great um, natural supplement, but it also has many negative ne medical side effects. Right. So you can't just be taking these things. No. Following Google or you know reading an no. article that one person put in, in you know in the Vanity Fair or something like that. You can't just go on 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 one segment of information. Yeah. Um, on these things, but really combining many natural things with modern medicine is is the only way to live yeah yeah now the the other part about it is uh, i got the exposure to the center of integrated medicine mm -hmm. that you are yes. uh, also involved in yes i am which combina combines uh, natural medicine and it's and called it scientific medicine then yeah or or the, the you know scientific Talk i don't know it's it's hard yeah it's hard to yeah, talk about that a little bit yeah. in terms of uh, because, but it does the objective there. Correct me if I'm wrong. It's basically saying that how can I, wor wor uh, you know, d d do something about it that allows me to pre preemptive yes. of yes. potential yeah. medical pitfalls that come my way. So yeah. I probably started myself going to to that clinic. Uh, the um, um, 
and seeing Dr. Box Tart and his team there for probably four or five years. Used to get my IVs, my vitamin IVs, the Myers cocktails and get yeah. some magnesium and things like that, which are great for athletes and things like that. So really always been a little bit open to, let's say, the naturopathic side of medicine. Yeah. Um, I've always been very cautious because there are unfortunately lots of naturopathic components that that are not scientific enough or don't have enough evidence to, to really benefit the patients. And we have to be careful, right. um, you know, adding that into to significantly. Their clinic has really been amazing. Um, he's so knowledgeable. So really starting to work with him more and more, yeah. um, just learning from him as well. Um, yeah. So that I can actually treat my patients more holistically and, and kind of with a, with a more more in what we call functional medicine. So we're using functional medicine, which is not just give you drugs, but it's also about how do we prevent disease? What can we use? What medications or non-medications can we use? And what lifestyle changes can we do to prevent the disease itself? Working with the whole body. Makes a lot of sense to me, but it does. it's still somewhat controversial within... Very controversial. Yeah. So this is, this is a controversial statement I'm even making, saying that I'm working with them because... Yeah, and, is, and yeah. so why is that? Is that because, don't shake the, uh, rock the boat here, because we like it the way it is and we don't want to... Partially, I mean, it's like any industry, you know, if, if, if you work in, let's say, the food catering business, I think, you know, restaurants, let's use the example of restaurants. And then suddenly guys came in and said, we're going to have food trucks. I'm sure the guys in the restaurants would have a hundred reasons why food trucks are no good for food and how it can't be clean and, and, and come up with ideas, right? Yeah. And most of it's fear-based. It's very fear-based. Yeah. Um, some of the, some of the fear is also based on really kind of outlandish practices. And we can see the same in modern medicine, but we, we saw unfortunately more of it in natural medicine. Um, in just ways that seemed more, I always use the term frou-frou, but they're just not scientific. They're, they're not actually medicine, but they're also, even if we combine Chinese medicine, we use ancient, um, ancient rituals and things like that. They just weren't things that were actually healthy for the patient right. in any way. And right. unfortunately, there is a large portion of the naturopathic medicine that can be seen in that light. Right. And that's why it's always been very negative. It's been seen as a negative. Because the assumption is that that's the only way naturopathic medicine is done, right? Which it's not. Yeah. It has got a lot more credibility. In it the has last... got a lot more credibility, and functional medicine has become something now that a lot more medical physicians are training into, which is really learning back to the more natural forms of using preventative to preventative measures for medicine. Exactly. Yeah. So as you then look forward, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Tracy, and and to the next as we. Somebody is the medical profession is evolving. It's rapidly evolving, and yes. and much much more so than most people even anticipate. Yes, it's kind of talk to us about uh, what do you see in the next five, ten, twenty years from now. I think there's a couple of things that I can say about this, and and part of that even comes down to the current. Uh, COVID pandemic. I see medicine transitioning in a way that we didn't anticipate even a year ago, because of COVID. So we've now gone from very kind of, I don't want to say simple, very a, a system that was systematic for years, the same kind of medicine, we present it the same way, you have your GP, you do this, and then these other things on the side. So this being functional medicine, naturopathic medicine, clinics like uh, uh, Center for Integrative Medicine, those places were just seen on the side as kind of add-ons which they didn't support. We're now using a lot more of that into medicine and med medicine is integrating it very rapidly and we're seeing the benefits. We're seeing how much healthier we can keep people by using really good functional medicine and, and natural medicine uh, methods with, with modern scientific, scientific medicine. But the other thing that we're busy seeing a shift in medicine is into more of a component of telehealth and distance medicine. And this wasn't this has been on the forefront and been a bit of a push more recently, but with COVID, it's really gotten a big push. Explain that a little so bit. So this now takes your doctor almost physically slightly out of the picture. When, so when we look at telehealth, you're calling in, we're discussing it on the phone. It's taking away the face-to-face. -face. It's taking away right. uh, you know, that touch component of medicine. And that's very different and, and very, um, you know, I want to say maybe newer students and that may be, be trained in that more, but for me, even at the walking clinic, if I need to examine you, I touch everyone. I want to feel your pulse. I want to feel the life force right. in you. And that's being pulled out of medicine as we go to access.
Right. So we want to make medicine more accessible. What happens is you call in or you do it by video and there's less of this physical contact. What I found interesting, I had a personal mm -hmm. experience. You were there actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, so I had uh, yeah, my doctor sitting on either side of me and then I had an incident, uh, you know, that uh, fortunately worked out uh, yes. all good. But, uh, you know, so the specialist that I saw in Victoria, yes. uh, you know, the neuro neurolog neuro the neurologist, yes. Yeah. And, and so, uh, you know, on a Zoom, he just wanted to do a follow up, I yes. believe. And so I was on Zoom and my doctors, uh, Dr. Stacy <laughs> and Dr. Jason, yeah. were both sitting by coincidence right next yes. to me. And then uh, the, the doctor had me. Uh, walk and move uh, certain things. Do a couple I, of basic tests, yes. I, I kind of thought of that as being something that that may well be the direction of the future, although you cannot physically touch, yes. but you, you can already see a yes. lot and uh, yeah. it is an opportunity. So, so it, it, it just creates a difference to medicine that medicine can become kind of more like AI type, right? We can, you could be speaking to a computerized kind of person on the other side even. I mean, right. the concern would be is, can we then computerize, uh, you know, these, these faces or these, these memes in a computer that you would almost speak to and they can go through the algorithm so fast because we know with computers they can go through the other algorithms faster than we can always, than sometimes than what we can think right. and come down to a diagnosis kind of as efficiently as doctors would. So there's the concern that medicine is going to become very, very kind of hands off as well, yeah. which is really a negative way of preventative medicine. It becomes very computerized, it becomes very back to that, this test at this point, that point, this point, and that, as opposed to, let's say, the functional component where we're trying to do preventative medicine to go, let's yeah. see the person, let's yeah. work with them, let's integrate different formulations. Yeah. And uh, so I feel like medicine is evolving in ways that, that we're not going to understand by yeah. right away. Yeah. I've been somewhat involved in the last month or so, and I've been very, very impressed by it. You know, so including uh, you know the uh, uh, the people that work, uh, the frontline workers, and yes. uh, you know, very impressed. However, uh, you know, the uh, I always feel like we are in the the other half I call of the province, mm -hmm. the capital of the other half of the province <laughs> is Prince George. Yes, and. Uh, you know, and in and, and the 56 years that I've lived here, when I first came here, mm -hmm. especially on George Street where we are now, yes. this was a boom town. And, and the normal conversations between people were, when did you get here and when are you leaving? Yes. Right? So that was normal. Since that time, obviously, uh, Prince George has evolved. Uh, and fortunately, I, I was able to be very active in that as well because I like to be proactive in the community. I know you do in, in a lot of ways as well. That's and, uh, you know, so and a lot of things uh, have changed. Uh, you know, if you look at the college, if you look at uh, the other amazing, uh, you know, project obviously was uh, UNBC. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, and they're even running a northern medical program through there now very successfully. So we're able to graduate students locally here. Unbelievable. Oh, yeah. you know and and so the battle that we had to fight then 30 years ago yes. and and that brought everybody mm -hmm. together uh, you know to, uh, to convince the Socrates at the time to commit the dollars for yes. a freestanding university mm -hmm. was an amazing undertaking since that time uh, 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 particularly those anchors have changed Prince George but it's still a natural capital of yes. Northern British Columbia. And I usually, whenever I talk to my friends in the Southern part, I still believe you have to do more, uh, you know, for uh, a center of uh, excellence attached to the College of New, New Caledonia, like yes. BCIT. The other thing that always kind of bothered me in a way, I know we are spending some major dollars on uh, and, uh, surgery or a, a, a tower attached to the hospital. That well, is. Well, part of the, the pro so part of the problem with hospitals and um, access and things like that is when they when they look at the needs of a hospital. I mean, there is X number of years that it's going to fit into the the local economy, and obviously, if you have any growth, it's not going to keep up. What we now deal with is we have a hospital that cannot cater for its its intake for for the population it's serving because we serve Prince George as well as everything north. Everything north, yeah. Um, and with that, 
it's not just even the, like the surgical component, it's the fact that we only have so many operating rooms. So let's say we have eight operating rooms, you can only run eight procedures at a time, at, yeah. you know, at any one time. We only have so many anesthetists because we only have so many operating rooms. And then right. it comes down to the size of the emergency department and the size of the wards. So our hospital cannot keep up with what it's required to do. and. And we can only, you know, multiple departments are always looking for to try and increase the size. Yeah. But at the end of the day, they, they I mean, this is where government and uh, local MLAs and hospital directors will come in to kind of come together and decide which portions can they grow, which will give us the most kind of success, at least for the time yeah. that we can grow it in. I mean, we've got, we've got a wonderful heart clinic running now. They were hoping to start doing angioplasty in Prince George, which is where they, when you have a heart attack, you would not have to be transferred to Kelowna or Vancouver, yeah. you know, to get, but it, the, unfortunately the capacity is just not here to, to run it. So, you know, and I find that troubling because, you know, like the cancer clinic, mm -hmm. I think was fantastic. Amazing, I, yes. I love it. And some of the yes. things we were quite involved in that and yeah. have been supportive of that. And, and as, as you have, yes. and, and with all the things they do and, and it's just amazing, but we still find, uh, you know, we had, a, a, a young fellow that, uh, we were helping Brady mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. with special cancer that could not be treated yes. here. Yes. And then, uh, ultimately he had to go to Seattle and he's doing well actually yes. now, but, why can we not spend the money and upgrade those? Like the hospital here is an old it hospital. Is. It is. You know, why don't we spend the money? The other thing that bothers me about this, this is different than the coast. You know, why, uh, you know, in a lot of circumstances, uh, you know, like uh, I work in mills and in the bush and, and, mm -hmm. and out in areas that are difficult, we should have helicopter service here. Uh, you know, that should be something here just as all part of it because a lot yes. of people so, uh, so we don't have direct helicopter access because the airport is so close so yeah. patients then get ambulance to the airport and then get medevac from there um, it is difficult to say why why do we not get more resources unfortunately that would be a political discussion yeah, yeah. i'm not necessarily update updated yeah. <laughs> on the <laughs> politics to know it but it is unfortunate if we just look at the the example of the angioplasty though the you know doing like the cath lab type stuff it does come up to volume when we're dealing with such micro specialists and the, the, we would need the micro specialist somewhat on call all the time because we don't know yeah. what time someone's coming in with a heart attack no. to be able to support such a venture you would need the volume of people having that condition yeah where we can go there's going to be at least five to ten cases or three cases or whatever the number is every day so paying multiple people and having this running 24 7 right. is is feasible and I, I feel like some conditions unfortunately are just luckily not as as common here or our numbers are just not high enough to warrant the expense. And, and and it's again, we're not putting a price on someone's life and saying yours is more valuable than mine. Right. But the logistics is we cannot afford to run something like that if we don't have the patients to fill it. So yeah. in all the time that you've been here since 2008, mm -hmm. 12 years, 13 years, yes. going on 14, is that we've made great headway, right? With the university, the medical school, uh, yes. University Hospital yes. uh, of Northern British Columbia, and then the cancer clinic. Yes. Uh, you know, but but still, uh, I can talk about the political side yes. because that's what I do. Just <laughs> saying that uh, you know the uh, uh, seventy-five to eighty percent of the, uh, the the gross domestic product comes from Northern British Columbia yeah. and goes into there. And I always kind of remind my friends down south that it is very very important to keep mm. up the pressure. Yes. and investing in yeah. infrastructure here yeah. and that to me is very important and i, I feel like part of the change uh, and again this is just my experience that i'm speaking of and my my own opinion this is not the opinion of anyone else is that i do feel that the medical system and i'm speaking mostly now of prince george is very say compartmentalized it's very segmented into kind of different aspects and nobody nobody mixes it together so it's a very old system that they're they're hesitant to change um i think Many of those in charge have been comfortable there for so long and that change would make them quite uncomfortable. Yeah. And that, that we're not seeing the, the progressiveness that we need because people don't want to be uncomfortable and change things. They yeah. don't want to go, you know what, this is better or we should be working with this or these yeah. two departments should be talking to each other. 
in a better way than sending a fax to someone's office and hoping they heard yeah. about something. We should have a better system that, that allows everybody to feel part of it, where I can speak yeah. as, as a physician myself. I, things are very broken and I feel outside most of the departments and I feel outside most of the information most of the time. Things will change and I'll have no idea they've changed. And yeah. I cannot spend every single day no. checking every website and checking every no. newsletter and reading every long email no. to, to make sure that I haven't missed some new update. And yeah. so it's a very, very broken system. Um, and I feel even if we can't increase capacity in certain aspects, if we were able to improve how it runs in a communication way and in a connected way, yeah. that would change people's care already at least 50%. Yeah. We get 50% improvement in how people are able to feel treated, get access and know what's going on um, if we were able to actually connect everything locally. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the other part about, uh, you know, I was uh, born and grew up my up to the time I was 24 mm -hmm. in Holland and Holland has uh, you know a, a, a good medical system too. They not have one of the best. Yeah not unsimilar to Canada yes. in a way yeah. and uh, you know and, and very good uh, medical schools and all mm -hmm. of those that uh, you know the I'm still feel good about living in Canada mm -hmm. with the medical system that we have yes. and and that people increasingly including myself become more aware of uh, you know the uh, you know that how do I stay healthy and yes. fit and and yeah. ultimately for yeah. long levity yes. because uh, you know quality of life yes. at at uh, at the end is the most important that yeah. you have. So the know. medical college, you know, they try and do these things where they're promoting that patients get healthier and stay fit. You know, they used to have a pro like a, a yearly thing where you walk with your doctor and things like that, but they were very. They were very small. They, this was a drop in the pond of making an effort of saying stay healthier. There was a time, I think this was back in 2010, you know, you, you, they shipped us a bunch of pedometers and give them out to your patients and get them walking again. But it was not, a, it was not in, a, in a, a, a broader approach of how do we prevent medicine. There was no other support. It was kind of a, a band-aid of, look, people are walking more, they're going to be healthier. Um, and in general, I feel if we, if we don't even acknowledge our allied medical services that we can use, you know, you look at physiotherapists, I'm a big supporter of acupuncture, I do acupuncture myself, right? Yeah. So using other forms of medicine yeah. for health and prevention, yeah. there's no ways we're going to be able to prevent disease the way we're thinking we are. Yeah. Yeah. We have to incorporate all of it into the lifestyle. How does that happen now? Uh, you know, like if students that, uh, you know, that go to uh, you know the medical school mm -hmm. here or in, in uh, at UBC and yes. down south is it are they being taught the other practices like definitely not um, I can guarantee you that they're not being encouraged to use the other practices very much so it really comes down to your self-exposure yeah. whether they know people or have used other functional medicine or naturopathic medicine kind of forms themselves would would allow for how open they are to it but in, in general medicine, they're not, they're not teaching this. No, we, we're using more other techniques with like trigger points and, and little things like that, which are, you know, um, different forms of medicine, but it's still very much controlled to, to the old uh, kind it's, of doctrine. Yeah. It still needs, yeah. you know, getting into. Yeah. But I, I think some of that comes down to licensing and control of the other, um, you know, kind of co-medical uh, specialities, right? So if the college, if the College of Medicine cannot control that those specialities are graded to a certain level and that they're safe to incorporate, I think that's why they're just keeping all of it out. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. The, yeah. Uh, it's a, it's it's a very functional medicine is definitely growing. It's it's becoming more spoken about. It's not as taboo. I can tell you every day when I suggest to people to use, you know. Uh, to use Dr. Box or his clinic, or even other forms, acupuncture and things like that, people often raise their eyebrows and go, wow, I wouldn't, wasn't expecting to hear that from you. Um, and then, you know, occasionally you get people that you can see they have no interest in incorporating that, and a lot of other patients are very open to it, and they're yeah. eager to know the information, and or go speak to someone else who has even more information to, to look yeah. after themselves. Yeah. yeah. So the, the other thing I just want to do quickly, because mm -hmm. we, we brought it up before, is that uh, so that your daughter was uh, only three at the time. Mm -hmm. And so I was going to Earl's trying to eat healthy. 
and so I had uh, the uh, a salad and I used to go by myself and I take my iPad and kind of check emails or whatever right so while I'm sitting there eating and so and then this little girl comes to me and starts talking to me and 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 you know I, I love kids right so and I started talking to her and then I started I, I have lots of pictures of horses and yes. I started showing her yes. my iPad with the horses and and the and then I thought, oh, I don't know where the <laughs> so, you know. Yeah. So and so, when was that? That was so. That was, that was probably about five or six years ago. Yes, and I, I, I want to say I can't remember if it was my mom or aunt was visiting. Two from South Africa. Yes, yeah. yeah. I think it was my mom and my aunt actually. Yeah. Probably for my mom's fifty-fifth birthday, um, yeah. they both came came up here and uh, we were at dinner. And Maddie, like her mama, has has some confidence and, and she, she was just engaging with you. And I remember her dinner came and we made her sit back at the table and she kind of kept going over to you. And eventually she just removed her plate and she had dinner with you. Yeah. So she sat with me <laughs> yeah. and, uh, you know, and we... At three and a half, she sat across from a complete stranger and... and yeah. And had dinner with you and, yeah. and yeah. And yeah, by then I knew you were sitting on the, uh, <laughs> yes. you know, a, a couple of tables open and everything yeah. was okay. And so we just kept talking and she ate and I yeah. ate and... Uh, and then you guys were going mm -hmm. and said hi, hello, and yes. uh, you know. So and then, uh, thank you for buying me the dinner. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. <laughs> and another kind of small factor to that even is that um, if we, you know, we always go back to like your mom's maiden name. So my mom, my mom's, my mom's also a Brink. So there was there always was always brink? that. Yes, my family are Brinks. Oh my goodness. Yes. So my uncle's still a Brink because he never obviously lost his surname to to yeah. marriage. But yeah, they were amazing. All brink. Yeah, huh? my mom was a yeah. Brink. Yeah, so the, uh, and obviously South Africa yes. has, uh, because of Large the Boers, Dutch, yeah. have a lot of uh, Dutch background in yeah. it, uh, yeah. you know, the, and Afrikaans, uh, you probably speak, I speak uh, it, yes. yeah. has a lot of, uh, Dutch, I don't yes. think I can understand it, but it has a lot of Dutch in it, I believe. You'd be surprised, actually. I, I've been able to hold conversations with, with Dutch people, and the, the writing is definitely similar enough that you can read and kind of understand what they're saying here. Yeah. 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 So, uh, you know, the, uh, but, uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it was uh, interesting. And then I think I bumped into you again at Gold's Gym because yeah. we both used to love frequenting there and, and yeah. we had our little morning training times and yeah. you would be there when you were training for your, for your competition and yeah, IGC. I'm going to go back there though. Definitely. And, and I'm nearly 81. So, Excellent. uh, I want to compete again and uh, when I'm 82 mm -hmm. next year. And so I look forward to that and, uh. You know, but thanks to you and and uh, uh, Jason, Doctor yes. Jason as well, and others, and uh, becoming more aware of uh, you know what's preventative, yeah, yeah and what preventive. we can do even just to manage. I mean, I always felt, you know, I said I I'm healthy, I, I look after myself, I have a very positive outcome, and yet why did I get cancer? And I can tell you, I woke up one morning and I knew I had cancer. Yeah. Um, and and it's it's not enough to do the basics right. anymore. No. Unfortunately, life is too stressful. Gotcha. There are lots of toxins. Our food quality is not great. And I'm not trying to do the naturopathic spiel here. I'm doing no, no. the. This is what we're going to need to incorporate even into regular medicine. If we if we stand a chance in not having you know disease numbers just skyrocket. Right. Yeah. People are getting sick because we're not going. You need to make this change from early on, and it's not indoctrinating that we end up with eating disorders or over exercising or any of the stuff. Yeah. But what we need to do is be very conscious of the decisions we're making. Yeah, but it's never too late. It's either. never too late. Oh, without no. a doubt, not yeah. at all. You know, it, like any change you make, even yeah. small, I tell patients, even if you make a you know a ten percent change and just consistently stick with that, a year later it would have dramatically improved health and the longevity yeah so if we sit here and after our discussion mm -hmm. that we have had and we kind of reflect back and to our guests that may be watching us that mm -hmm. uh, we, we say a couple of things i yes. believe at least from my opinion and, and hopefully yours as well is that i say adhd add is not an uh, affliction it is not a liability it's an asset and it can and, be an asset and 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 Every, every person is different. Some may need medication, some not, but looking at it with a negative attitude is not healthy. No. It's, it's, 
it's it's just a different way the brain works yeah and the sooner you recognize it yes. then you can adapt to it but do yes. not treat it as something that is negative yes it, it may well be in some cases yes. positive as it appears to be for you and for me exactly and and the other thing that uh, you know in, in kind of closing is that uh, the medical system is changing uh, I believe become more proactive, understand it, uh, you know, move your body. You yes. don't have to go compete or something, no. but, but at least, uh, you know, try to at least a couple of hours a week, if and preferably more, yes. be active walking or yes. whatever you do. Yeah. Diet, extremely important, extremely right? Extremely important is, you know, and the diet, and I'm not preaching diets, I'm no. preaching what we're putting in and, and quality of what we're putting in. And I know it's very expensive to eat good quality foods, but really being conscious of the decisions you make right. and the quality of the food and, and making, again, just small adaptions. Instead of three spoons of sugar in your coffee, try one, right? Even small changes, reduce sugar intake. Sugar is probably one of the biggest toxins that will drive all kinds of disease yeah right and and making small changes in what we eat and what we put in ourselves and become aware become right? aware yes and 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 alcohol uh you know i grew up in, in and i'm not saying don't drink but i'm saying the the excessive use of alcohol and the excessive need to have alcohol in everything we do and 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 the 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 addiction to the 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 socialization of it as well. Yeah. Um, you know, really being conscious of whether that drink is, is needed, whether it's going to be for a fun time or whether this is just because I have to every night because it calms me down. That That's a problem. It, it, become, it yes. potentially becomes it become, a habit, right? It becomes so, a habit. But yeah. if you're using it socially for, for that kind of thing, that's okay. So there are, there are healthy ways to use alcohol much better than we are. But not using it is just fine too. <laughs> you know, and not so using it is just it's fine accepted. too. Exactly. I don't yes. drink and, yes. uh, and nobody yeah. ever says, okay, well, uh, you know, blah, 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 whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it's all part of a healthier lifestyle. Yes. Uh, it's, it's very, very critically important. Things can go wrong and to be become aware and uh, yes. uh, live a healthy life. Vitamin D, I think again, if I can just throw this in last minute here, vitamin D critical for Canadians, please, there is not, you will not have enough vitamin D. And if we look back to, you know, if we look back to the old ages that we speak of, vitamin D used to cause rickets. These people had, their bones used to bend, they were unhealthy. And we, we kind of understate the importance of vitamin D and a thousand units a day is not enough. Yeah. Vitamin D will also look after things like cholesterol, help, you know, this is, this is all preventative stuff. Take the vitamin D every day. V vitamin? Vitamin D, yeah. 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 So we're, we're talking two to 5,000 units every day. I give my kids vitamin D every day. We need to be using it more. Depression, cholesterol, bone health, mood, all of these things you need. This is something that comes, you, we look at these videos, we watch these things about Africa and these people are always smiling. We go, why did the Africans have nothing, but they're always smiling. You know what they do have? They have a lot of vitamin D in the sun. Interesting, I yes. never knew that. Uh, Think about it. we watch these shows about these starving kids that Plan yeah. Canada and these other yeah. organizations try and advertise and yet they're always smiling. Yeah, yeah. You know, they're they starving, but they're smiling. And, yeah. and we go, it's so critical for health yeah. um, in so many different aspects. Right. Yeah. So doing things outside, being sun conscious, wear sunscreen, those kind of things, but taking the vitamin D so that we can look after ourselves preventatively and, and yeah. actively to manage day-to-day -day things. So Dr. Tracy Lotzi, say, do I say it lot? Lutz? I usually say lots. Lots? I think it used to be Lotzi back in the yeah. day it had an umlaut, but yeah. we've kind of dropped that over time. So Dr. Tracy Lotz, it was a pleasure having Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, we want to do this again at some point. And, yes. uh, uh, and, and you are my first guest on this particular series <laughs> of podcasts. Thank you. It was my pleasure. You're welcome. Thank you very much Thank for you. being here.